Hey, friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Tom Utes. He's going to tell a story about how Bobby Bear inspired him to move all the way from Germany to Nashville to start a new life. I think it was October of 1981, so I would have been 12 years old, uh, barely 12 years old. And there was a TV show in Germany called Country Time with Freddie Quinn. Freddie Quinn was an old uh, actor who had a great career in the 40s, always playing like a sailor type or something like that. And and he liked country music. And he had this TV show on, on uh, German public television. And they would bring in a house band from Nashville. And Doug Jernigan actually played in that band. And I talked to him about that a couple of times. Anyway, they, they'd bring in a house band and they'd bring in a couple of artists from Nashville and a couple of German uh, artists would play. And I watched that as a kid. I don't know why. I had been playing the flute and the piano since I was six years old. And um, so one day I watched that show and Bobby Bear played Detroit City and Pour Me Another Tequila Sheila. And I was just, I didn't even freak out. It was more like I was just somewhere between frozen and more than excited about something. It was some something in my psyche had been touched by that music. So I, I went in the room in my sister's room borrowed her guitar and started playing guitar that day and taught myself the chords to Detroit City and it was not just the music it was the way Bear looked the way he wore himself it was um, in hindsight it was seeing an archetype seeing something that my unconscious mind related to and I knew in that moment that that was what I was wanting to do with the rest of my life and, and I did and um, Eric Brace actually found a photo of the cast of 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 uh, the band and the the artists of that of that show and sent it to me a couple of years ago and it's and I remembered exactly what Bear looked like it, I had it was frozen in my mind anyway so um, years later when I decided to when Eva and I my wife and I decided to move to Nashville we uh, made several trips here and um, tried to buy a house and then that fell through and we got really nervous because we left. I got really nervous. Eva didn't get that nervous because I, you know, I had a good middle class kind of income in Europe playing music and touring and a studio and a band and a van and gigs. And I had left all that behind, which was cool, but it only becomes reality once you're here. And uh, so um, I kind of got cold feet, but we decided, hey, let's let's go to Nashville one more time and, and make sure that this is the right thing to do before we move full time. And we already had the green card and all that. So we came to Nashville one more time and a friend of mine asked me uh, if I wanted, if we wanted to go to the Bluebird that night. And we said, sure, who's playing? And he said, it's Merle Kilgore and friends. Merle Kilgore being the guy who managed Hank Jr. and also the co-writer, uh, June Carter's co-writer on Ring of Fire. So we went to the Bluebird and it was Merle Kilgore and it was Russell Smith of the Amazing, Amazing Rhythm Maces. And it was Costas, who was a very successful writer in town, who's since moved back to Wyoming. And the fourth chair was empty. And I was sitting at the Bluebird at the at the seat where you have your back to the bathroom and your right parallel to the front door. And uh, so, you know, shortly before nine o'clock, the fourth guy walked in and it was Bobby Bear. And I just went like, all right, we're moving to Nashville. And then years later, through my friend Peter Cooper, um, we, I was working on the on a series of records about the American Civil War, and we asked Bear to come in and sing on it, and and he came here to the studio that we're in today and and sang. And um, ironically, he told me this later. It th that singing that song totally turned him onto the Civil War, and he became sort of obsessed with the Civil War since, and has been reading more than I have ever read about the Civil War. But anyway, he was super cool. Um, he didn't want to take any money. I bought him a couple of nice cigars because I knew he was going to be into that. And then we had a show at the Franklin Theater, a, sort of a release show. Actually, it was on the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Franklin, and Bear came out and sang uh, Lorena, which is a song from that was very popular during the Civil War. A lot of children, a lot of girls during that time were named Lorena because that song was so popular. And then he sang that song, Rip It Into Rags, that we, that, that he recorded. So, Had you heard country music before? Yeah, I, I, I had heard country music before without really knowing what it was. When I was, uh, how old are you when you go to First Communion? Probably eight years old or something like that. I got a little 
radio with a cassette player built in for my grandma for my first communion. And I just listened to that at night every once in a while. And we had, uh, we had Canadian Forces Network and American Forces Network, and I could tune into that. And there was, not sure what weeknight it was, might have been Tuesday or Wednesday, there was a country music radio show on AFM. AFN, American Forces Network. And I listened to that and I, it spoke to me, but obviously at eight years old in Germany, I didn't speak English. I started taking English lessons in school when I was 11, I think. Um, so, but the music spoke to me, but I couldn't identify the instruments. Like I heard the pedal steel guitar, but I didn't know what it was. Even when I saw somebody play the pedal steel guitar on that TV show, it just looked like a weird little table to me. I didn't know what the instrument was. And I also didn't know what the, what a dobro was the first time I heard it. I knew it was a guitar and I knew it was played with a slide, but I couldn't understand how anybody could play as, as fast and as accurate with a slide. Well, it turned out it was Jerry Douglas. And it was the first time I heard the dobro. And so it was, you know, I certainly didn't grow up in the middle of nowhere and I certainly didn't grow up poor. My, my, parent, my dad was a teacher, so we were sort of a middle-class family. But it was still the early 80s, so there was no internet, obviously, and the next big city with a any record store of, of any significance was probably about an hour away. And that was not a trip we'd made every day. You know, we'd make that trip maybe twice a year to buy clothes and shoes and stuff like that for all the kids, but for kids. And so I could go to a record store there and they would have like a country section with maybe like 50 LPs or something. And I didn't, I didn't hardly know who anybody was. I knew who Johnny Cash was and I knew who Bobby Bear was, but I bought some records just because they, the cover art spoke to me, like the first Doc Watson record I bought. I had no idea who Doc Watson was, but it was a Doc Watson record called Down South. Doc and Merle Watson, it was just Doc and Merle sitting on that front porch of a little country store. It spoke to me, and then I heard the music and obviously freaked out once I heard Doc play guitar. Well, I think, you know, Bear is so important because he was not just, I mean, Bear reinvented himself after he was sort of like a real clean cut looking folk type singer in the 60s, he became um, sort of one of the inventors of the outlaw thing. He didn't go to Texas because he wasn't from there. He, he did it here in Nashville and he gave a lot of outlaw writers a home by having a publishing company where they recorded. And then he recorded all those incredible Shel Silverstein songs and all those incredible Bob McDill songs. And he just had a, had an awareness for um, the importance of the, of of the lyrics and the importance of the change in in lyric writing that had happened in the use of the language. And so tremendously important guy, obviously. It's just one of those natural things. And a couple of years later, I again played with Bear at the Hall of Fame to honor the great Bob McDill. And uh, obviously Bear had recorded lots of McDill songs, including one whole record that's called Me and McDill. And so we played Amanda with, with Bear, with uh, Bob McDill sitting a couple feet away. It's pretty cool. Anyway, I love Bear. Did you tell him that he was uh, a link in the chain? Oh yeah, you? yeah, yeah. He knows the whole story, and I think it makes him very uncomfortable. Yeah. He never wants. He's never. He never talks about it. I, I send him a text message on his birthday every year and and tell him thank you for saving my life, and he never responds to it. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, subscribe to my channel. Click the like button and tell me down below what your favorite Bobby Bear song is, and I'll see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you.